Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 3 of British History. Today we'll be discussing the English Reformation again, but we'll focus on part 2, Elizabeth I. Now if you remember previously on Civibrit, we discussed the Tudors together. In particular, we focused on Henry VIII. We talked about his divorce with his first wife and the opportunistic break from Rome that it represented. So together we tackled the Act of Supremacy from 1534. We also talked about the fact that he became the head of the church and the head of the states, therefore leading to a consolidation of royal power. And finally we discussed the fact that the monks saw their monasteries dissolved in the wake of the Act of Supremacy. If you remember as well, heads were lost in the process. And when fighting against the Roman Catholic Church, eventually, who won out? It was Henry, of course. My father, as Elizabeth I. Now, Henry's legacy Basically, when things get started for us today, the break from Rome, we can also add to that the union of church and states, increased royal authority for the Tudors, and a son, finally a son, after all this, a son, Edward. Now, here he is. The outline for today's lecture will consist in Three parts. We'll begin with a new era of turbulence, for a little bit of a change, of course. We'll talk about Edward VI, Mary the First, and Elizabeth the First. That'll lead us to the question of the Elizabethan Church. Elizabethan, not the Elizabeth Church. I wish there was an Elizabeth Church, but Elizabethan. A via media or compromise between Protestantism and Catholicism. We'll discuss religious opposition and that will take us to the consequences of the Elizabethan settlement. This time I got it right. We'll talk about a feeling of national unity, the survival of England and the monarch's destiny, being tied together and finally potential tensions to bring about episode four in a couple of weeks. As I was saying, we begin with a new era of turbulence. And to discuss this, we'll talk about the son, the promised son, Edward VI. What we see with Edward's reign is the introduction of Protestant beliefs into the Church of England. If you remember, with my father, Henry, I'm still Elizabeth, of course, um, with my father, it was more of an opportunistic break from the Catholic Church. But what we see with Edward is actual, real Protestant beliefs being incorporated into the Church of England. For example, an English translation of the Bible. So what we witness is basically Protestantism taking roots in England, becoming something that is not just Protestant in name, but actually in nature. This leads us to the question of the Succession Act. Indeed, if you remember, and how can you forget, Henry wanted a son and he finally managed to get a son. This son benefited from the attention of the whole country as the long-awaited and only male heir. But there was a complex situation in terms of succession during Henry's reign. Indeed, with the first Succession Act, of 1534, Elizabeth, his second daughter, was the legitimate heir. She had just been born very recently. Mary was a bastard as the Catholic offspring of Catherine, if you remember, whose marriage to Henry had been declared illegal. Then there was a second succession act a couple of years later, with Elizabeth being declared a bastard. Oh, here's my underling. Thank you very much. You may leave now. Sorry, my servant brought me a little, a little vegetable juice. It's not a Bloody Mary, it's vegetable juice. 
Where was I? Ooh, I feel pumped because of vegetable juice. The Second Succession Act basically uh, made Elizabeth a bastard as well, following the conviction and execution of her mother. Anne Boleyn, if you remember last week, had, had already been falling down. So in 1536, there was basically no legitimate heir to the throne. Oopsie, doopsie. What happens at this point is that we find ourselves with a complex political situation that does not last for very long because of Edward's birth in 1537. Hooray! A third act of succession, however, changed once more the legal status of Mary and Elizabeth. It was passed in 1544 and it stipulated that Edward should succeed first, before his two sisters, Mary and Elizabeth. So even though he was not the firstborn, he was a man. This third act of succession repealed the two previous ones. So if Edward was to die, to die childless, then Mary and Elizabeth would succeed in that particular order. Now when Henry VIII died, Edward was only nine years old. But the succession went smoothly with Edward having a protector. Now you may be thinking, what is a protector? It's a regent in charge of a kingdom. What it means is that during the minority, while uh, the, the monarch is under the age of uh, majority, uh, or if he's absent for any reason or incapacitated, then the protector rules instead. If you can take a close look at this particular artwork, you can see Henry on his deathbed pointing towards his successor. That's the little kid, Edward VI, my brother. To the right of Edward, you can see members of his council, including uh, his protector. In the insets that is in the top right, what you can see scenes of the destruction of holy images. And below Edward, you can see the Pope. You recognize him because he's wearing this particular special Pope hat, his Mitra. You can see him being crushed by the word of the Lord, literally. That's what it says, written. In English. Okay, so what about Edward's reign, you're gonna say? Social tensions uh, existed during his reign because of enclosures. Don't worry about it for now because we'll discuss them a little bit later on. And there were political struggles. But basically what you need to remember is that England finally turned Protestant for real with a book of common prayer uh, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, issuing Two books of common prayer, all in all. A compromise, basically, between old and new ideas. Except that, and I need some vegetable juice before I discuss this. Edward suddenly got sick. And sicker. And dead. In 1553. At age 15. Here's a family portrait of Henry VIII and his daughters. What now? We find ourselves with only two of Henry's children still alive after all this. Catholic Mary, she's pictured on the far left, and Elizabeth, a Protestant, pictured on the far right of this family portrait. And you can see Edward and his mother on each side of Henry. Mary was exiled with her mother, Catherine of Aragon, at first, and she kept the Catholic faith. Now, at this point, Catholic laws, at this point I mean when Edward got sick and then got dead, Catholic laws who had opposed the Reformation secured the female succession of Mary. And then they were to later on marry her to the Catholic King of Spain, Philip II. But they did not live happily, happily ever after, as you probably guessed. Let's have a little bit more of that vegetable juice. Three Bloody Mary. Two Bloody Mary. Three Bloody Mary! Oh shit. Okay. Now, Mary I reigned between 1553 and 58. 
She reintroduced Roman Catholicism in England after her brother, half-brother, had properly uh, set up the Protestant faith in the country. She reintroduced ca Roman Catholicism in England. She cancelled her, father, uh, her father's reform and she cancelled her brother's reform. She restored the authority of the Pope and she left her mark in British history as Bloody Mary. She is remembered as Henry VIII, firstborn, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, and Catherine had been deeply humiliated by her divorce. So her daughter remained true to her mother's faith. So she remained a Catholic and she resented her father's attitude, you know, the whole bastard business that I talked about during the Succession Acts, hence the nickname Bloody Mary. Um, as I was saying, uh, she remained true to her mother's faith, Catholicism, which led to the burning of those she saw as heretics. So during her reign, several hundreds of Protestants were burnt as heretics. Oh, let's not forget to have a little bit more of that tomato juice. Five a day. Now, the question of Mary's legitimacy is particularly interesting. She was the legitimate heir to her brother through her father's third act of succession. Remember the one that re-established the bloodline. She was deprived of the crown, however, by her brother Edward. Indeed, Edward had drafted a document in 1553 that appointed someone else as his successor. Um, not her successor, his successor. And it was Lady Jane Grey, third in the line of succession, meaning that they were first the two daughters of Henry VIII and then Lady Jane Grey. She was a royal blood and she was a distant relative. Why did he want her? Because she was a Protestant and Edward knew that Mary, his half-sister, was a Catholic and he wanted a Protestant. So he tried to have Lady Jane Grey succeed to him as a Protestant queen. But Mary had no problem revealing the plot and overthrowing Lady Jane Grey very quickly after nine days, which is why she's remembered as the Nine Days Queen. So she was very quickly executed, didn't reign for a long time, uh, queen for nine days, and then uh, imprisoned and then uh, executed at age 16. Now, Mary's religious policy, as previously discussed, consisted in restoring the Catholic faith. Um, during her time, reformed intellectuals, that is to say, people who had converted to Protestantism, fled to the continent, for instance, to Strasbourg, to fight back from a safe place. So those are Marian exiles, exiles from Mary. Uh, and they uh, basically became a bit, of, a bit of a plague to Mary and a blessing to Elizabeth, that is, I myself, later on. Opponents that remained were sued and executed. As I was saying, about 300 Protestants were burnt at the stake, hence the nickname Bloody Mary. Now, Mary decided to marry. To, Prince, uh, to marry Prince Philip, uh, heir apparent to the King of Spain, who then became the actual King of Spain. This was a foreign match with a super duper Catholic king that was quite unprecedented in recent history, at least. Now, even the King of Spain had no, uh, even though the King of Spain had no power in England per se, and he spent most of his time in, uh, in Spain. Um, they produced no uh, heir to the throne. So Mary and Philip did not have uh, an actual uh, son or daughter that could uh, then live on to become the next monarch. This whole thing basically became a topic for jokes, embarrassment and anger when Philip convinced Mary in particular to embark on a war against France. In the unsuccessful process, Calais was lost. 
And this was pretty shocking to people because the city was a strategic military outpost. As you can imagine, it was uh, based in a strategic location. And this was felt as particularly embarrassing and particularly bad. Mary eventually became ill in 1557 and she died a year later in 58 after reconciling with her sister Elizabeth. She was, generally speaking, not mourned actively by the nation. Uh, it is sad that as she was nearing death, she declared, When I am dead and opened, you shall find Calais lying in my heart. Famous last words, or not, uh, because of, the, again, that shock and the pain and the humiliation of having lost Calais. But she's interesting because she's England's first female ruler in her own right, without a male consort acting as a regent for an infant son. She was actually ruling per se. And historians have recently been far more sympathetic to her unbloody reign, to use the expression Bloody Mary, compared to her father's and her sister's, with, for instance, a high number of heads being chopped during uh, their reigns. So now we've got Mary who got ill and she died and Elizabeth starts ruling. Her father, as you remember, was of course Henry VIII, but her mother was not Catherine. Uh, it was Anne Boleyn and she was seen as illegitimate by many people because she was not the first wife that the king had married. But she was brought up as Protestant and she was supported by Protestant lords, those who had, uh, who were Protestants. So she restored Protestantism in England. She was 25 when she succeeded her sister. Uh, and her mother, if you remember, had been executed supposedly for adultery and witchcraft in 1536. Um, she had spent some time in the tower. She was imprisoned there on suspicion of preparing a Protestant uprising and her sister had appointed her as her successor. Uh, when basically it became pretty obvious that no offspring would come out of her union with Philip of Spain so that there would be a need for someone to succeed to her that was in her child. So basically we end up now with Elizabeth on the throne. England was divided at the time between Catholics, you know, those who had supported Mary, and Protestants. So there was risk, risk that a civil war would break out. As in France, for instance, if you take a look at uh, St. Bartholomew's massacre of French Protestants in uh, 1572. Potentially, this was already happening, and indeed we see Protestants hunting down Catholics in London around 1560. So basically, divisions, religious divisions. After Mary's rehabilitation of Catholicism, Elizabeth had to tread carefully over the religious problem. She couldn't do what she wanted and it was a tricky situation. She did not move at first, but gradually imposed her own view of faith via media. Readopting Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer, firmly rooting England in the Reformation. So this takes us to point number two, the Elizabethan or the Anglican Church. Via media, literally a middle way, via why media, middle, via media, a compromise between Protestantism and Catholicism. Now, in 1559, a new act of supremacy was passed. The monarch became the supreme governor of the Church of England. If you remember, Henry was the supreme head of the church. Elizabeth was the supreme governor of the church. This act of supremacy really enshrines England's switch to the Protestant religion, to Protestantism. Elizabeth reintroduced uh, Protestant theology, more specifically Calvinist, but if you're not an expert in that question, you don't need to worry about it. We'll see that there is going to be a recap of the differences uh, during the, the tutorials between the Protestant and the Catholic faith. 
So don't worry about it too much at this point. What matters is to remember that this charge doctrine contains 39 articles of religion, as they were called, a book of common prayer. Protestantism is restored and Catholicism becomes illegal. The Anglican Church is basically a Protestant Church that is based on a Calvinist Protestant theology. There is no belief in science when there is an actual belief in science in a Catholic religion. The Bible should be read in English. Remember, that was important to the Reformed Church. Salvation of the souls cannot be guaranteed by the works of charity or by the payment of money. Remember the indulgences? You cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot buy uh, salvation and, you know, the erasure of, uh, of your sins. So what we see with Elizabeth is England's going back to Protestantism as had been the case during the reign of her own father and her half-brother, Edward VI. But that religion being more rooted in the country than it was before. But the church did keep Catholic elements. For instance, a hierarchy of bishops and archbishops, which was typically Catholic. At the top, the monarch was the governor of the church, not the pope. They were Catholic-like ceremonies and decoration of the churches to reinforce the authority of this particular hierarchy. Protestant independence from Rome was the rule, but that being said, the Catholic notion of obedience uh, to church leaders did remain. So what we see is a new church, but with continuity with the past. That leads us to really wonder whether the Elizabethan settlements meant that England was specified, that those religious tensions that had existed disappeared. Now Elizabeth indeed was convinced that she needed to pacify the country, that she needed to unite rather than divide her subjects. So she forbade Catholicism in the kingdom, in the realm, but tolerated Catholic magnets. That being said, I mean, it's hard to restore an absolutely perfect balance. So the balance remained precarious in the kingdom with spectacular crisis. So we're going to tackle some of those moments of, uh, of crisis. Discussing first religious opposition. The Counter-Reformation was being organized by the Roman Catholic Church. The Company of Jesus, founded in 1534, was particularly active. Then he had a very militant view of Catholicism. Uh, priests were actually sent over to England from the continent in order to try and spread Catholicism in order to try and advocate the superiority of the Catholic faith as well. So Elizabethan power resented those guys coming in and telling them, you know, Catholicism is so much better. So these missionaries were arrested, tried and even executed. Now let's take a look at the response of Catholic European powers. Uh, We've discussed the company of uh, Jesus, if you remember. For the papacy to regain influence with the Counter-Reformation, Council of Trent, pictured to the sides, and to oppose uh, England's independence, there were two main strategies that we're going to go through together. The first strategy was forcing change from within England itself. So Elizabeth was excommunicated by the Pope in 1570, which means that any potential assassin was given guaranteed salvation. In other words, the Pope says, go ahead, if you, you know, kind of end up getting her, come here and we'll protect you. You'll be saved and you'll death 
Depot, Mo's Dach, go to heaven. So plots to kill Elizabeth and find a new monarch um, did exist and were revealed, of course, in time because she was not the victim of a plot. Uh, we can mention the Babington plot of 1586. English Catholics wanted Elizabeth's cousin, my cousin, Catholic Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots, not to be confused with Bloody Mary, right? This is a different Mary. They wanted her to take the English throne because she was a Catholic. Scotland had successfully resisted English invasion for centuries. And early in the 16th century, Scotland was allied with England with Henry VIII's sister marrying James Stuart, King of Scots. Now, their grandchild Mary was allied with France, the Catholic enemy of Protestant England. So, knowing that she was also England uh, for, uh, she was also not English, she was also Queen of France for a while, we end up with a situation that, as you can imagine, is potentially quite fiery. If you ever need to really understand the links between the members of the Tudor family, please refer to this family tree and you can see Mary Stuart to the side, um, Queen of Scots, and you can see that she's different from Mary the Vast, who reigns from 1553 to 1558, that is to say right before her half-sister Elizabeth. Now, Mary's personal involvement in the plots against Elizabeth are not quite clear. It's not sure that she was involved in those plans uh, directly, that she really did want to overthrow Elizabeth. In 1567, Mary was depo de deposed by Protestants who seized power in Scotland. Uh, Mary's son became King of Scotland. That's James VI. He's going to be important. Well, he comes back in this series of... Uh, you know, lectures a little bit later on. Um, Mary wanted refuge in England, but Elizabeth kept her kept captive. So she was kept in captivity. Uh, and after uh, a plot, a supposed plot, she was finally executed in 1587. date it's important. Uh, there is a recent film called Mary Queen of Scots uh, that basically had Mary and Elizabeth meet and sort of be somehow involved in a sort of friendship but the reality is that they didn't actually quite meet in person so the accuracy of that particular film as a lot of those films actually is um you know is disputed now i was saying that there were two strategies uh fast forcing uh change from within england a strategy number two forcing change from outside the country the invasion of england in particular on the part of catholic spain number one power in europe at the time problem the failure of the invincible Armada, the invincible Spanish army in 1588. Notice that it's just a year after Mary Queen of Scots was executed. So it would make it really look like Catholics did not particularly like the fact that she was executed, basically. Now, what were the consequences of this settlement? On the one hand, we can say that there's a strong feeling of national identity, national unity that grows from the settlement. Indeed, we can talk about internal unity because there is a mutual threat, the threat of Spain, for instance, an external threat, and it means that we can all be together, feel united against European Catholics. 
so much so that the Catholics become the enemies of the state and of the nation. So it's, it goes beyond just being a Catholic and having a different religion. It means that you're an enemy of the state. So anti-Catholicism um, and Protestantism became the expression of English national identity. Basically, there was a feeling of belonging to the same nation, to the same imagined community. That's an expression that's used by Benedict Anderson, so not used at the time. That's a, a more modern expression, a modern lens that we use to interpret things. Um, and what we mean by imagined community is that we will never meet everyone uh, who belongs to the same community or the same nation. I cannot meet every single person in that nation, but I imagine us as sharing characteristics. There was also the fact that the survival of England was tied to the monarch's destiny. With necessary obedience to the monarch, the spiritual leader and defender of England from internal enemies and external enemies like Spain, the virginity of the queen, you know, uh, Elizabeth being known as the Virgin Queen, which was a way of preserving the nation's independence from foreign powers. The Spanish Armada that I mentioned a second ago was defeated. Uh, basically what ha happened is that you had tensions between England and Spain that had started to spin out of control. Uh, because there were English ships that regularly attacked Spanish ships coming back from uh, the Americas. You had Sir Francis Drake, maybe those are names you've heard, Sir Walter Raleigh making fortunes by raiding Spanish ships and fought with Elizabeth's blessing. Now to avenge uh, these offences, in retaliation, Philip gathered a massive fleet in order to attack England. Plus add to that the fact that Mary, Queen of Scots, had been executed uh, and that just made things even worse. That was even more of an attack against Catholicism. Now remember that since 1066 and the Norman Conquest, England had never been invaded. And that uh, it's only in 1588 that the Invincible Armada sailed from Spain up north to try and invade the country. But that did not work out. There was the problem of the bad weather, singular, not plural, bad weather. And the English sacrifice, uh, that sacrificed a couple of ships by sending them engulfed in flames right into the Spanish fleet's close formation, setting the other ships ablaze, setting the other ships on fire. So they basically set fire to their own ships, sent them to the, towards the Spanish to set the Spanish on fire. Hence the, the name fire ships. Uh, the victory against the Armada was seen as a token of God's protection. The Protestant wins you know, the bad weather being sent to protect England and her queen. So there were numerous feasts and celebrations. And the humiliation of Spain was unquestionable. The English started to glorify Gloriana Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, who had been executed, excommunicated, not executed. Never. By the Pope in 1570. Anti-Catholic sentiment kept growing and there was a sense of national identity being tightly linked to Protestantism. Catholicism was truly associated with external threats, the danger of foreign interference, foreign invasions, foreign dangers. Elizabeth marrying uh, a foreign prince, Elizabeth marrying a Catholic prince, as her half-sister had, was a big no-no. The idea was to save England's religious and political independence, hence the name Virgin Queen. But there were potential tensions. Elizabeth was a childless queen. If she's a virgin queen, it wouldn't do to have children. There were uncertainties, therefore, about the future and potential succession, with the possibility of conflict over two different conceptions of faith, two different conceptions of social relations. The idea of the Protestant spiritual equality of all men, the personal reading of the Bible, remember those core Protestant ideas, uh, 
combines and leading to the highest literacy rates in Europe, as well as a new sense of individual wealth and dignity um, coming, basically being born because of higher literacy. That was in contradiction with that hierarchy of clerics, bishops, and the monarch that had been kept, if you remember, uh, that Catholic-like hierarchy that had been kept in the Elizabethan church. There was also the risk of England's isolation from Europe, with um, Elizabeth I encouraging exploration and expansion. I mentioned Raleigh and Francis Drake. This led to the growth of economic power in the merchant class. Indeed, in cities like Bristol, uh, London, of course, uh, there was trading with the East and with the so-called New World. The Queen authorised Drake's pirate activities thanks to a letter of marking. So we see the example, for instance, of French privateers that you can look up if you're curious. There was the growth of foreign trades, with merchants becoming increasingly wealthy thanks to that foreign trade, leading to social mobility. But in reality, generally speaking, there was no real social stability. Uh, and there was a gap between the rich and the poor, a gap that grew wider and wider. Throughout that period, there was a demographic outburst, meaning that basically there's population growth, more and more people being born. But there was no matching increase in food production. This means that there was malnutrition with some people starving in places like Cumbria, for instance, which is a region of England. There was inflation, the prices becoming higher and higher uh, and forced many people to steal or find other solutions to stay alive and not starve. Others were wandering on the roads. So this leads me to tackle uh, one of the last points for today, the Elizabethan poor law that created a subsidized system of poor relief. And you'll be discussing a new poor law next year in your year, uh, in your second year. So you'll need to understand the Elizabethan poor law in order to understand the new one that came later on in the 19th century. So thanks to local property taxes, the local authorities could give away food and clothes to poor people. Okay, there are so many Marys that I've mentioned. There's Mary Tudor, I've not even mentioned her, but if you hear about her, just know that she's basically Henry's sister. Uh, we haven't discussed her uh, together. We've discussed Mary the First, Henry's daughter, Queen of England, the so-called Bloody Mary, and we've discussed Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, executed by Elizabeth. What do we learn from this? Number one, the English Reformation occurred without too much blood, except on the Bloody Mary. Uh, that was thanks to the Elizabethan Church of England, which was a compromise between Catholicism and Protestantism in order to avoid uh, something that was very likely, which was a civil war. And if you look at France at the time, you see that this was definitely a risk. So this pacified the country, but tensions remained nonetheless. So there were two potentially contradictory trends. The consolidation of the state's power, you know, uh, head of charge, head of state, but the emergence of an English nation, a feeling of national identity with men that were increasingly independent economically, socially, with the birth of capitalism, and intellectually as well with Protestantism. Uh, there was conciliation during the reign of Elizabeth with the, at least the myth of harmony and balance between the crown and the nation, between the monarch and her nation, so-called peace, order, harmony as the core values of the era, a sort of go golden age, uh, or at least that's how it was seen. But what we'll see together in a couple of weeks is the open conflict that starts in the 17th century. Now, if you want to know more about what we've discussed, you can take a look at uh, the uh, textbook, the Miosh, and the Elizabeth the First series on YouTube. You've got uh, a few episodes that you can watch. Remember that you need to revise and memorize. That is key. So list the key dates, key people, key concepts, key events of the period. In the next episode, we'll tackle royal absolutism and rebellion together. 
Now what I'll invite you to do is to keep count of the heads that are being chopped, basically. What I want you to do is count the heads that fall throughout the period that we're discussing together so that we can do a little bit of a head count and perhaps somebody may be, or somebody or some people may be able to win the great prize of knowing that you've managed to calculate.